you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we begin to unravel the mysteries behind the remaining seven underworld kingdoms and the origins, motives, and cultures of the raves that claim them as their homes. This episode will focus on the Dark Kingdom of Jade. Explorer. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. I've been standing here for quite a bit, watching you scan through our books and making extensive notes. If I didn't know you as a keen ghost hunter, I would have thought you were looking for something and didn't want to be caught. You're also quite the nervous individual, if I may be so bold, so your reaction is not only priceless, but quite expected. I do have to say that you won't find anything in those notes and tomes that we haven't spoken about before. You really have have exhausted most of our records here, my young friend. There is, however, a few things left to discuss, and those are the varying dark kingdoms that inhabit the rest of the underworld, surviving as they could in the pockets of their tempest. Perhaps, dear explorer, we begin with one of the ones we know the most about, who are perhaps the biggest after the dark kingdom of iron. Who? Why, it could only be one dark kingdom. It is the dark kingdom of jade. I doubt you need reminding of this, but just on the off chance that you do, the dark kingdom of jade is a part of the underworld dedicated to and controlled by the dead of Asia, excluding India. That is its very own entity that we'll discuss another time. The dark kingdom of jade occupies everywhere else within the Asian continents. The Asian underworld is centered on China and the necropolis of Zion, where Qin Shin Chin was buried in the 3rd century BCE. Its society is divided into China proper and the conquered territories, which is the rest of Asia in this underworld context, with the exception of the Indian subcontinent, just to clarify, though we understand that it often wrestles control for Japan, which has revolted against its tyrannical ruler on more than one occasion. Its ruler is China's first emperor, Qin Shi Chin, who you also know as Yu Xuan, the Jade Emperor, the God of Heavens or Ruler of Heaven, depending on who you ask for a translation. In various Chinese cultures and ancient traditions, Yu Huan is said to be a representation of the first god, but I wish to remind you, dear explorer, that the wraith Gwyn Shi Chin assumed that name as a persona, an ancient rebranding, as it were. The beliefs and stories of Yu Huan succeed that of this wraith with a god complex. Gwyn Shi Chin is a name you may recognize outside of our conversations, for he, unlike many of the characters we have talked about, is someone that anyone outside of our field of study say was a real person. Quin Shi Chin was the founder of the Quin Dynasty and the first emperor of a unified China, a unification by his own doing from 221 BC to 210 BC. China had monarchs before him, but he did away with the established title of king, previous Zhang and Zhou rulers, and emperor would stay as a title for future monarchs for some two millennia. He is known as a skilled leader, but he was also a tyrant, both of which applied to his rule in the Skinlands and the Shadowlands. As a mortal emperor, he outlawed most forms of religion in China, requiring people to be loyal and obedient only to the government. He also ordered that most of the existing books be burned and the scholars who worked and spread their teachings. As far as he was concerned, history began with the rules of the Qin Dynasty. Every time he captured people from another country, he castrated them in order to mark them and made them slaves. Punishment was severe and it took many forms, such as, but not including, fines, public beatings, long sentences for work on the Emperor's many projects, including the construction of the Great Wall of China, which I have read is an impressive haunt for many a wraith because of this. That's not all the punishments, mind you, as you also have mutilation, castration, and even death, which is the most 
commonly in the form of beheading, but sometimes also included being boiled alive. You can imagine how this would translate when he ruled the underworld when punishing raves. I don't think I have the stomach to go over the seven trials of his own personal hair was punishment. It's because of Quinn's leadership that much of what we know of China is shrouded in history, with many a rave off the time of Quinn's rule believing there is or was no time before the Emperor. We do, however, know some things. To the relevance of this discussion, the rules around death are very important to all of Chinese society and the family unit. Special attention is paid to the care of the dead and very specific rules are followed, lest bad luck comes to the family that does not honour the rules. Traditions can vary depending on the deceased's role in the family, their age, the manner of death and the position in society. Care for one's parent is complete and without question, so when a parent or elder dies, Funeral planning falls to the eldest son and his children. A parent may not perform funeral plannings for their child, so an unmarried person is taken to a funeral home upon death. Chinese rules also say that an older person must not show formal respect to a younger person, which means a child is buried in silence with no funeral ceremonies performed. Said tradition also varies depending on where exactly in China you are. Some Chinese people follow Christian beliefs and burial traditions. In mainland China, there is land available for cemeteries, so Christian burials take place. Some Chinese people believe in the teachings of Buddha. In Hong Kong, the Buddhist practice of cremation is encouraged because land there is needed for farming. The Chinese have believed since ancient times in spiritual afterlife to which the soul journeys after death. Like many religions and cultures, the Chinese believe that the dead will need physical objects in the afterlife and so bury them with prized possessions such as gold, jewellery and pottery. This in turn often means that raves tend to have many fetters to their family, said objects which generate a large amount of pathos, particularly if you were wealthy in life, which is something that tends to resonate wherever you are in the world. These early raves were able to carve small kingdoms of themselves fighting each other for control as they established systems of reaping souls. You can imagine the shock that certain raves would have, believing they would be worshipped and honoured, only to be instantly attacked for their relics. There were also various attacks of hungry demonic spirits known as Quay, a troublesome spirit that roams the world causing misfortune, illness and death. Whilst we at the Phoenix Institute have not encountered any of these Quay, research suggests that these are not spectres but something uniquely dangerous all the same, rarely travelling away from their bodies. These spirits are said to manifest when certain burial rites are not adhered to properly and their pole, one half of the soul that is said to identify with the physical world and body, becomes warped and vengeful. The other half, in case you were curious, is the Hun, which for our line of work is the equivalent of a wraith's psyche, the more spiritual or higher functions of a wraith. It can also represent deviousness and antisocial behaviour, so the Hun is not necessarily a higher or rather a more enlightened state of being. Anyway, there is little one can do to control a Quay in the underworld, and even less to communicate with one. There is one special Arconos for that, we will get onto that later, I promise. That isn't to say that spectres do exist in the Asian underworld. They do, with some ancient scriptures stating they destroyed other kingdoms, both in the underworld and the skinlands, leaving massive power vacuums in their wake. Gwen Shi Jin was a member of a ruling family which sought immortality. He believed that he would be able to both to live and reign forever, and constantly sought elixirs which would guarantee eternal life, and has surrounded himself with mystics in the kingdom of Quinn, entering fits of rage when they could not produce the results he desired. It is from this point forward, established history deviates considerably. Gwen Shi Jin was visited by a group of powerful wizards that followed a magical tradition called the Ways of Spirits. Led by a man called Vyuzia, informed the Emperor his death would come in a few years and so too would his empire. He 
would offer the now angry empire eternal greatness in the afterlife, which as we discussed, mirrored China pre-Quin Shi Qin rule. Viu Zia and his followers of the ways of the spirits claimed to have much knowledge of the underworld, offering to aid and teach said secrets to the emperor, in exchange only remuneration appropriate to their efforts. Quin Shi Qin was quick to dismiss the mages but would spend the night discussing with Viu Zia, eventually agreeing to said tutelage. Under Vuzia's guidance, the Emperor gave strict instructions on how he wished to be buried and what honours and rituals were to be performed, as were the construction of his tomb, a huge complex modelled after his palace. On the instruction of Vuzia, Emperor Quin Shi Qin ordered the creation of 24,000 terracotta statues of warriors to be buried around his tomb at Xi'an. Each one held real weapons and were coated in the soldiers' blood, none of them knowing why this was happening or the occasion following the banquet. It was all part of a ritual explorer, so that allowed him to come into the underworld armed for a conquest, a massive funeral complex. No and an army of the immortal guards which dwarfed any military force at the time. Vucia stole their souls, all 24,000 of the Emperor's best soldiers ritually sacrificed, binding their souls to the warriors. When the Emperor died, he was able to raise 18,000 of these soldiers as his immortal guard in the Shadowlands, which he used to establish the Dark Kingdom of Jade. They are the infamous immortal guards who are not raised in the traditional sense. The immortal guard remained headquartered in the necropolis of Zion, guarding the Emperor's fetters, glowing unusual shades of orange and red that are not natural to the underworld. They are able to move with too perfect smoothness and agility, storing excessive amounts of pathos, always trained or active deployment. It won't surprise you that they are almost unkillable. Quin Shi Jin would excitedly enter the underworld, ready for his new eternal post and powers. His favourite courtesans and servants were all killed to serve him as the second emperor. Quin Er Shi, or son of Quin Shi Huan, Chin rather, I always make that mistake, took over. Quin Shi Jin would cut the cowls of his servants and courtesans with the relic sword bestowed upon him and addressed the remaining soldiers in their new forms in this relic of Necropolis. He would lead them into battle, showing mercy to those few wraiths that attempted to attack these new wraiths. Those spared were the few citizens of the Jade Empire. Even with the 600 shoulders short that were both terrified and angered the Emperor, it was just a force not heard of in the Shadowlands. It was rare for a warlord to assemble a thousand soldiers, let alone nearly two. Quin Shi Jin would ignore pleas of mercy from his opposition, making it known that he was the ruling force in his new empire, establishing the foundations of his government as he and his army conquered and marched, drawing in waves to expand his armies under the supervision of some immortal guards. Ministers were chosen for loyalty and the ability to carry out their orders to the latter, not personal initiative. In less than a year, Quin Shi Jin dominated China, with only one real target left, a resistance group at the Great War he himself commissioned. The encounter was almost a disaster, for the opposing Li Kun had a powerful dangerous weapon, a powerful Malfian by the name of Lun Huan, that's said to have taken the form of a great white dragon. It agreed, the two, that in exchange for the souls of Li Kun and his followers, Lun Wang would destroy the Emperor's immortal guard. The guards and the Malfian spectres would attack, each impressed by the strength of the other. Armed with the magical scepter Ju Yi, the Emperor took on the Malfian, striking a horrific blow on the dragon, causing streams of black light to tear from the Malfian. He fled, claiming the Emperor the victor of this battle and the sole ruler of all China, within the confines of the Shadowlands, that is. As he established his empire, he dwelled on the destruction of the Malfian, realising he could not assume ruler of the dead if he did not travel into the Tempest and slay the Spectre. He knew he would have to expand his reaches beyond the Tempest eventually, but what his knowledge was lacking as a mortal mage and his fair the young experience lacked. Well, experience. The problem was that the scholars within the Shadowlands feared him as one would expect. 
One knave did answer the call, one that claims to be 500 years old. She assumed the form of a middle-aged woman and offered all she knew about the Tempest in exchange for a favour placed at his court. Skeptical at first, but he did sense that the woman had an air of power to her. The Emperor will disappear then with the woman to the Tempest, and only he knows what happened, as the woman did not return with him. Many have speculated that this woman was the Malfian in disguise who revealed himself in the Tempest, who was bent to destroy the will of Quin Shi Chin with the aid of that infamous spectre, revealing all of its secrets. However, there is more evidence to suggest that Quin Shi Chin was destroyed and replaced by the Malfian Lord, applying his creative talents as a director of the Asian dead. Of course, you may conduct your own research and come to your own conclusions. The Emperor would gather souls aplenty to work at the Necropolis of Xi'an and taught them the arts of soul forging. Construction on the Great Imperial Highway to the Jade Palace began as the Emperor made his first tour of every province of the land. His audiences were filled with fear, not wanting to be seen as disloyal for not attending. He had changed and was filled with many powers and speculations about his identity began to emerge. It was at this point that Gwyn Shi Chin would assume the mantle of Hu Huan to assume that he was the ultimate authority, that no good god was greater than he. His word, the word of emperor, was divine law, and every subject was obliged to accept and obey his will, this self-proclaimed lord of the dead. It would take centuries to build the Jade Palace and the pathways connecting it and the rest of the Dark Kingdom of Jade, establishing the four magistrates and bending those in power to be loyal to him and to the imperial bureaucracy within the Jade Palace, the political centre of the Jade Kingdom, all the while expanding his territory and dealing with revolts and revolutions galore. The Jade Palace is set to compose of thousands of separate buildings from which the Emperor is said to occupy 251 separate palaces within the complex, moving between them in secret, presumably to keep his advisers on their toes and to test their loyalties. The four magistrates, before you ask, direct policies and actions of the lower officials as simple need of dealing with their own responsibilities because the kingdom is just too bloody big. The protectors, or the proctors rather, of the prosperous realm are watchdogs for the common good, which translates to the ears and eyes of the emperor. They can go any anywhere they please and make any request from any citizen and it has to be obeyed. They are investigators and make what they believe are appropriate accusations to the relevant authorities to the other three branches. To say that they are fit would be an understatement, dear explorer. The judges of the dead are interpreters of the law of the Jade Kingdom. Anything goes if it keeps the alleged violentless streets peaceful and happy. Every wraith in the Jade Kingdom is a member of the Imperial Army, but it is only only the members of the military that make up one of the magistrates here. It is said that almost every family encourages a few members to join up for a tour of duty or two which serves as a great path of promotion, wealth and opportunity. If they can't handle it, they become great resources of white jade, jade manufactured from the plasm of ghosts in the Jade Kingdom. It is used to manufacture artifacts in the same way that soul forging is used in Stygia. Jade in the sense can, when attuned, become a living substance capable of holding Yin and Yang Chi, at least according to these wraiths. Different colours of jade have different properties. Anywho, there are also the Jade Sensors, who are responsible for ensuring new wraiths are reaped and treated appropriately, as well as for deciding all questions regarding the ownership of relics. The catalogue of every soul who enters the Empire and assigned tax duties on items bought into the Underworld. You have probably noticed there are some similarities to the ways of Stygia, but also a strange blend of modern and new practices. Well, the Jade Empire today is very much a product of thousands of years of evolution, just like pretty much anywhere else in the world. The Emperor, Yo Huan, was once involved in many, if not all, aspects of his kingdom, exploring as much as he could. This is not the case anymore, as we believe he is mostly remaining in the halls of his Jade Palace, keeping an active hand on his government 
that way, bringing in strong faith and beliefs of the philosophy of legalism developed by Han Vesey. For a very brief summary, those who would define themselves as legalists advocated government by a system of laws that rigidly prescribed punishments and rewards for specific behaviours. They stressed the direction of all human activity towards the goal of increasing the power of the ruler and the state. In short, encourages a practical, if not totally, way of ruling. Yo Huan uses Hans Fezzi basic principles of governing, which are 1. Know and compare all the various possibilities. 2. Push failure with unvarying severity and maintain the awe in which the rule is held. 3. Grant generous and reliable rewards for success. 4. Listen to all views and hold the prosper accountable for every word. 5. Issue unfathomable orders and make deceptive assignments. 6. Conceal one's own knowledge and make inquiries of a minister. And 7. Speak in opposites and act in contraries. They are principles that the Jade Empire knows well across the 20-ish provinces that mirror many of the Skinlands equivalents in the Skinlands, with Hu Huan having disposal to four capitals. Each province is headed by a governor who maintains peace and proper activity in his or her or their territory. Necropoli have mayors with similar roles, albeit on smaller scales. No leader is the same, mind you, as more ambitious mayors will superficially differentiate if their necropoli is powerful and important enough. Some also deal with imperial matters rather than provincial authority. And when the law needs to be laid down, the forces do not hold back. One of the unique ways is through the five unique Arcona, mainly adopted by the Immortal Guard. One of them is exclusively theirs, which actually totals up to six. The start of one, that particular one I mean. Chains of the Emperor was created by Emperor Yo Huan himself, with fewer Sia, allegedly. This Arconos was designed to subdue, not to kill, by creating chains, shackles, and nets, and so forth. It is extremely effective, especially when I share with you that failed attempts to escape actually heal the Immortal Guard. The way of the scholar is used primarily by the magistrate members, particularly those who are the proctorate and the judges. It also allows those who have developed their hum, the psyche, to become more sensitive to the psyche to the point where eventually they can control the minds of others. The way of the farmer is the opposite as the focus is on the po, making it akin to castigate as that is not so widely available in the Jade Kingdom for a whole host of reasons. Its main usage, however, is to try and tame the quay. I told you we'd get onto that. Another Arcona substitute is the way of the merchant, and it is similar to Eurasri, but with a different philosophy. A tradition from ancient China had merchants heavily looked down upon. They were viewed as greedy and immoral, commanding very little respect. However, everybody needs a merchant to get what they want, and every race needs pathos, which is probably why such a mindset fell out fairly quickly. The way of the artisan allows one to manipulate the various kinds of jade and relics found within the Jade Kingdom to, eventually, make nearly anything. Artisans understand that everything in the afterlife is made from the souls of something from the living world, understanding its soul to accomplish their goals. Finally, there is the Way of the Soul, which is the odd one out here. All of the previous Arconi find their roots in the Convocurian teachings of the Jade Empire and the ancient China with it. The Way of the Soul draws upon the Taoist beliefs. This Arconos is the opposite of Castigate. Rather than looking outwards, Way of the Soul looks in to fight their own demons rather than leave their fate in the hands of another. There is much, much, much more I could rant about the Dark Kingdom of Jade, but to be terribly honest, dear explorer, much of the research that we have available to us comes from a Western perspective looking into a country that is rather difficult for the likes of us to get into, and I would hate to bred such dated ideologies. Besides, my line of work focuses on the dead, not the living. However, there is no denying that the Dark Kingdom of Jade is a force to be reckoned with, one that finds itself at a crossroads. Its forces are stretched thin, and rebellion happens all the time. 
the Empire demands more white jade, which forever spreads the need for the conquest of its lands. As for Stygia, the Dutark kingdoms are locked horns for multiple occasions, and there is no doubt in my mind that Stygia awaits another attack. We do not know Hyo Huan's plans, but we know he remains eternal and untouchable, secure in his power. To be kept updated, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.